So good morning, everybody. I'm Nino Künzli. I'm sitting here in Lugano at the place we should all meet now. And unfortunately, we have another model found. But in fact, um, under the big leadership of Professor Susan Sachs, we have found a way to move entire school of, public, of um, the Lugano Summer School online this year. And I'm very pleased that this is such a big success. And I'm very pleased to chair and moderate now the seventh plenary session of the Lugano Summer School. And um, we have a wonderful, very interesting topic here. It's about the design of healthcare environments, um, which we all understand that under the stress of COVID, this has raised a lot of new questions indeed. Um, it is my big pleasure to present to you two real experts in the field with uh, Professor Mino Aftali and Professor Arne Scheuermann. We are wonderfully served for this morning. Arne, he is the head of the Institute of Design Research and Professor of Design Theory at the Bern University of the Arts. And um, he graduated as a communication designer. When with a PhD in communication design, he is editor of books and of media theory, and he does research in health care design, in visual rhetoric, and in counterterrorism. Uh, quite an interesting CV, I have to say. So he leads the research group Healthcare Communication Design, and uh, he's also the president of the Swiss Design Network and of the board of this newly planned Swiss Center for Design and health in Bern. And Professor Minu Haftali, she is coordinator of the interdisciplinary research group Healthcare Communication Design at the Bern University of Applied Sciences and the deputy head of the Institute of Design Research at the Bern University of the Arts. So Minu, she worked for 10 years as a professional designer in the area of product, furniture, exhibition and communication design. And her PhD in social anthropology was about the role of design in culture-specific nursing homes in Switzerland. Very interesting, I have to say. And her research is still focusing on healthcare design and social design. So this is uh, wonderful to have you both here on the floor. You are exchanging your talk and I'm happy to have over the screen to both of you. Arne, Minu, thank you. Thank you for having us. Um, this is how we're going to do it. Uh, we have a technical setup in which we will be sitting this way for the Q&A session and I have to change place for the first uh, talk. So we will have two, um, two inputs, one by me, one by Minu. And after that, we have enough time for Q&As and I'm happy um, to hear about your questions, to learn from your perspectives. And um, hope, we hopefully will have a vivid discussion. So I have to change the place. And just to remind the audience, the participants, if you have questions, you can put them into the chat um, in, the, in the Zoom system. In the Q&A. Oh, sorry, not in the chat, in the Q&A. Yeah, there is an Normally. Q a Q&A um, button. Please use that one and not the chat for your questions. And we will handle those and um, discuss it. Yeah, Please, Arne. Okay. Normally, you have to have uh, to handle the mask now you have to handle the mic and the glasses irgendwas is immer so um welcome to this um presentation of some of our ideas some of our research work the design of healthcare environments we like to present it as the following um i will give a short introduction into what is healthcare design about so um, mainly what is evidence-based design about since this is very close together and it's one of the methods that we use um, in our research uh, projects. Um, we will have a short introduction into our research group so that you know a little bit about our backgrounds and the research paradigms, methods, and some examples. And then we will have the second talk by Minu, who will give you a deeper insight into some of the examples and um, some of the projects that we brought along. Starting point is how can spatial design promote the healing processes? Um, it seems to be important to understand this as a starting point of the whole discipline since um, it may um, it may be of interest that this discipline just emerged in the 1980s. It, uh, one of the first uh, studies that we rely on is this by Roger Ulrich, the view from a window may influence recovery from surgery. He did um, a big study in which he contrasts two groups of patients 
after a kind of a bladder surgery. And the one cohort was exposed to a view to the nature and the other one was exposed to a view to a brick wall. And the findings were really astonishing since there was a shorter post-operative stay, um, shorter hospital stay with an all over of two days, minus two days, and um, less medication overall and less negative comments on the uh, whole procedure, which helped patients to recover. And he came to the conclusion that it's up to 500 US dollars per patient at this time that you can just um, have in mind when you plan the architecture of a patient room at this point. So um, since then, we had more than 2,000 scientific studies over the last years, which is not really a lot if you compare it to other disciplines in the area of medicine. And um, it's still, it's still a, a, a simple and, 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 and a small community working here. But nevertheless, we have this like 2,000 scientific studies over the last, last years, which um, were addressing the recovery process of patients, especially the working conditions of staff and addressing the support of relatives um, with an overall economic and agiological um, outcome for a hospital. So this is the, the, the framework we're talking about here. Um, the healthcare design is a um, kind of paradigm that differs from other design paradigms. You may know something about industrial design, you may know something about graphic design, you may know something about design in our everyday life. Mostly we talk about chairs and cars and we talk about fashion design or even nail design is considered design today. And um, the healthcare design is pretty different from that as it is a science and it as it is a scientific way of looking at design. So um, healthcare design uses a lot of different backgrounds, a lot of different disciplines uh, to address specific questions on a evidence-based level. So healthcare design today um, can be seen as something that is evidence-based. So we rely on studies. We don't rely on, or not only rely on the aesthetics or the, the, um, the uh, personal experiences of the designer. It's very often it's experience-based. It has something to do with the um, design of our studies. Um, that very often we're not able to have control groups, so we have to go back to um, methods that allow us to compare experience-based designs. It's always human-centered. It's not about the, it's not about the technical or the, um, or the the uh, the outcome of a building in its ways of the architectural meaning. It's all about the people living there, the people working there, the people recovering there, and it is outcome-oriented. So it's not about making things pretty. It's about making patients healthy. So um, these are some possible ways to look at our discipline. Um, for example, if we look at biophilic design, which is a sub part of healthcare design, um, we look at the impact of natural elements in architecture helping patients to recover. You remember the Ulrich study from 1984. If you have a view with the nature, it differs pretty much from having a view on a brick wall. So, for example, the visual connection with nature plays a certain role, or the thermal and airflow varia variability <coughs> sorry, in a, in a building, and as well as the use of dynamic or diffuse light. Um, to give you just a short overview over our discipline, um, healthcare design over the last years emerged from this starting point, dealing with the patient's rooms, dealing with the spatial environment into a broader discipline in which we also um, look at the graphic design, the interaction design, the product design, the industrial design behind all those processes in a hospital. So this is one example from our research group um, where we um, um, developed a, a uh, application for elderly patients that help them with their compliance of taking medication. Um, this is an example from Patientensicherheit Schweiz, um, one of the quick alerts dealing with um, lure lock connectors and the possibility of reducing misapplications. You see, um, you all know this from the, the daily business in a hospital. Lure lock Anschlüsse are used for different means and for different. Um, in, in different situations and they all look the same. So you have this misapplications and of course it's a design problem. You could address it with a new 
um, with the new, um, wie sagt man, mit, mit, mit einer neuen, <laughs> mit einer neuen Anschluss in und außen Form. If you redesign the connectors in a proper way. Um, this is a project uh, from partners of us who developed a new design uh, for trays used um, in the operation theater. So the mark guides here prevent um, your material to, to slip and to mix up. Again, it's a design solution for something that you might, um, that you might find difficult to address with another discipline. And again, speaking about this uh, more or less near to the patient situated graphic design, industrial design solutions, we also look at the um, architectural um, situation itself. Like here we have a floor plan. Um, this is a study done by Choi from the um, Simtegrate Design Lab in the US. Um, what we're dealing here is that the patient groups um, within this ward were um, researched by the um, by the possibility and the li how likely it is in the rooms to have a fall and you see that the visibility of the groups play a big role when it comes to um, uh, to the risk of falling it's 31 higher fall rate in the red rooms that that are here in the corners of the ward and you can have the same uh, the uh, following study with the same um, research design and um, it found out that we have a higher mortality of 7% in that kind of rooms within this kind of architecture. Um, so again, to wrap this up, the overall idea of addressing healthcare related problems with design solutions is that we have an improvement of functionality, economics, economy, energy, efficiency, etc and the user satisfaction and the user safety. And in particular, by this, um, by this measurements and by this element. So over the last years, it took, um, it took us a little bit by surprise that the audio, um, the audio elements were becoming more and more important. So you all know about uh, alarm fatigue and the, uh, the very vital role that noise reduction can play in this. Um, circumstances. It's about the improvement of air quality as well. It's about reducing uh, the risks of infection and the improvement of, of orientation within uh, healthcare related buildings. So to say, we have an increase of the functional capacity and the reduction of running distances for the people working there for the staff. Um, our background here in our research group is an interdisciplinary one. So uh, the research group healthcare communication design was built in 2007 and it consists um, it, it, it contains uh, researchers from five different um, departments of the University of Applied Sciences here mainly the Department of Health and uh, the design here uh, at the Institute of the um, the University of the Arts and uh, then we collaborate with researchers from the area of architecture and business and engineering information technology, mainly the Institute for Medical Informatics. Um, we did around about 50, I would say 55 research projects um, with several partners all over the last years. And um, what we did is that we mainly developed and, um, and, and did research projects together with partners from our perspective in interdisciplinary groups as well. So it's not only our group who likes to um, bring different disciplines together, but it's also very often the case that we collaborate with partners who also bring different partners to the table, coming from healthcare, coming from architecture, coming from patient safety. Um, we did some site inspections and the design analysis of facilities. Mina will talk a, bit, a little bit about that later. And uh, communication measures as well as we develop together with our partners communication concepts and we support hospital planning processes from the scratch, which is very important because uh, very often design comes in last. So very often we have the built building and in the very end they come and ask for some signage or they ask for some advice at the color of walls whatsoever. And we say, okay, that's, that's a nice idea to think about those elements, but it's definitely too late. Uh, since the room is built in that way that is providing a higher risk for falls already or whatsoever. Um, 
last year we we founded the Swiss Center for Design and Health, um, which is going to start, have its operational start in 2021. Um, stemming from our research activities in the healthcare communication design group and with several partners, 29 partners all over Switzerland, we're planning to have a bundling of these activities in one place. Um, we're going to build a living lab, which allows us to have one-on-one mock-ups of whole hospital situations to improve our research in this area. We um, handed in an application for funding at SBFE. Some of you will know those games on the level of Schweizerische uh, Eidgenossenschaft, where you have to wait a pretty long time to get some, um, some answer for your funding. Uh, we have a funding commitment of the Canton of Bern last year. so keep fingers crossed, maybe we'll start next year. Um, just before I hand over to Minu and some of the examples, just a quick overview about our methods. So what we're doing here, we're, we're dealing with a new discipline, as I said before, we're dealing with an interdisciplinary discipline, we're dealing with a discipline that is addressing a lot of questions in contexts um, that ask for expertise from different perspectives. So we mainly stem from methods that we um, borrowed from social sciences and we added some of the design specific methods that are very specific in design research and evolved also over the last 30 or 20 years. Um, but mainly what we do is we have this mix of interview and observation to get an, Im to, 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 to get an Im, uh, impression of certain situation. Um, we are heavily relying on the identification of contextuality. Um, we know that a hospital is pretty different from another public um, player on that ground. We pretty knew that a oncology or a, a surgery department may differ in certain ways. And um, what we bring to the table here is that we are interested in combining those different elements, existing elements, those different pre-existing contexts and contrast it is with some of our research and uh, analysis methods, like for example, the rhetorical design analysis in which we don't ask for the, um, the functionality or the aesthetics of some design solutions, but especially of the impact and the effect of the things that we have in front of us. Um, this is how it works normally as every model, as you know, this is just kind of a handrail that leads us to our research project. But very often uh, we see this is the way to approach the situation in which we do our design research. That we start with the briefing, a lot of listening, shadowing and observation. That we then come to some conclusion of identification, identifying the context uh, of the project. Um, and this is the starting point for our research project, which very often combines the analysis and the discussion uh, which leads to rebriefings and which leads to uh, solutions that we implement. So it's kind of a grounded theory what we're doing here. It's kind of a, um, of a feedback oriented um, field research. Our leading question within this as a, from, from the overall perspective is how do patients find their way around the hospital? Uh, what experiences do they uh, make during their stay and how does this journey affect various actors within the hospital. So the patient journey here is not seen as a customer journey. We're not looking at it from the way of um, the patient as a customer, but we look at the different contact points and we look at the different encounters that the patients have with staff, with other members of the hospital, with the relatives and with the building and the build, it, uh, the build um, context as well. This is the point where I hand over to Minu. So I hope you can hear me. Uh, a warm welcome also from my side and um, I'm taking over from now and I will present to you some of our projects that we've done in the uh, last years and which show pretty well the way we work and what are the, what is the focus or main focuses of our works. One method um, that we have done in the last years pretty often and is quite elaborated now, uh, we call it the room inspections. 
So you have to imagine that we get a call from a hospital or from a nursing home and um, they contact us due to problems they have with the design of the environment of patient rooms or, or uh, whole wards. And we put up an interdisciplinary team, as Anne said before. So basically, we're most, uh, we are like nursing scientists. We will be an architect, a designer, somebody um, from informatics or from economy, depending on uh, what the, the focus of the project is about. And we um, go to have a look at these um, hospitals, these wards, these patient rooms. Now you can see here an example. This is a patient room. It was a mock-up. So it was a design of architects for a Swiss University hospital. And they built a mock-up in order to see how the materials um, um, how they seem, how, how the functionality of a room is, how uh, the hygiene of this room is. And we have a look at this room and look at existing literature, at research which exists in the uh, field of healthcare design, of evidence-based design. I will um, give you some explanations on these pictures, why I took these pictures. On the left-hand side, you can see, which is quite normal in patient rooms of hospitals, you see the floor. Um, on, on one part, you see like a linoleum floor. It's a dark gray um, floor in front of the um, bathroom. And, um, and it goes over into the wooden floor um, of the patient room. And uh, this looks quite nice. So from a design point of view, it's really a, a nice aesthetics. But from a functionality uh, side, it is um, not a well solution because as we know that people, especially people elderly people who suffer from cognitive impairments such as this, uh, dementia, they, uh, they see um, these kind of contrast, as you can see it here, like a light floor next to a dark floor, they see it as it was a stop, a step, and it is the possibility that they fall. So, um, so one recommendation would be to make it not such a dark contrast between the two colors, but to adapt the two floors uh, to each other. The second picture in the middle is, uh, as you can see. Um, a curtain dividing um, the room into two parts where two patients in a two patient room can have some intimacy, some privacy. But as you can see from the picture, it, um, it doesn't really work well because it doesn't stick to the, to, um, to the stick and so it falls down and hygiene and, and uh, hygiene and prevention of um, infection, you should, um, uh, it should uh, be uh, um, it should be safer, and the curtain should stick to this um, to this um, installation. The third picture on the right side, you can see the view into the patient rooms, and as you can see very nicely from that picture, you cannot see when you enter the room. You cannot see anything of the patient. But the the um, one part of the bed, but you don't even see his or her foot. So, and why am I saying this? Um, there are studies, um, international studies, that um, uh, prove that if nurses have a view into the patient rooms, when they enter the room and they have an in immediate eye contact with a patient, that the risk of falling is, um, is getting minim minimized. You can see here from a, Swede uh, a Norwegian study, um, two uh, ground floors of a possible design of a patient room, one where the bathroom was has such a floor design that you can have a, a view directly to the patient where he lies, and another one where the view is limited. And um, compared the two designs, uh, you will have a higher risk of fall in the right picture. And as you can imagine, of course, these questions also raise questions of offering a patient um, privacy or intimacy. So it's always about finding a good um, uh, compromise between um, safety, but also the need of patients to have some privacy in their rooms. This is another ground floor plan of um, uh, a hospital from this study I mentioned from 2019, which was presented in Basel last year at a conference about uh, environmental design. So, and here you can see uh, 
nicely uh, thought through ground floor plan where the bathrooms are put in a direction um, that um, you from in every patient room you have a clear sight and view to the patient and you're not um, there are no obstacles um, of the view. Here you can see one of our team members, Sabina Hahn. She is uh, the head of nursing at the Bern University of Applied Sciences. She is a team member of the research group, Healthcare Communication Design. Sometimes it's really also um, just functional aspects. Uh, you see here the cupboard in a mock-up of a patient's room in a very bright red. It looks very nice, very friendly, but we know from studies that um, in some patient populations, this kind of red can trigger um, stress and, and um, people who suffer from specific um, psychological um, disorders that they can um, be triggered by such a red. So another picture in the middle, you can see Sabina is entering the room. She opens the door and she hits her shoulder immediately on the cupboard so it's a really a functional aspect that that doesn't work there on the picture on the right hand side you can see the opening of a cupboard which looks from a design aspect very nice because it doesn't have any handles you just put in your fingers and and open but the problem is that the um you you hurt your fingers because um it is not really well thought through or from an ergonomical aspect it doesn't um it doesn't work one um, topic that we um, that we have in the last years more and more is a focus on age appropriate design in general hospitals. So a lot of hospitals contact us because they can uh, see that the patient population is getting older and older and so uh, and the room the design of the environment is not um, fitting their needs of this population and um, the model that I'm showing you here you most of you might know it it's the uh, so-called um, so-called um, environmental press competence model by Lawton and Nahemov already from 1973. And what this model basically says is that there is an interdependence inter between um, the design of an environment of environmental stimuli, which can cause uh, stress, depending on a person's capability um, to adapt to the environment and the adapt adaptive functioning of a person uh, within the environment depends on the interaction between those stimuli uh, in a person's physical or social environment and the individual's competence to meeting uh, in meeting these demands and so the these competences of a person um, are shaped by personal characteristics such as physical health or cognitive and perceptual abilities. And if you think about elderly people, um, they, if you think about physical functionalities, you know, a lot of people suffer from visual impairment. So this is something that we really have to be aware of and that designers have to take care of, that the design of the environment is designed in a way that it, um, that it meets the needs of people with visual impairment. And uh, if you think about cognitive functions of an older getting population, as you know, that more and more people are suffering from um, dementia. So also this is an aspect that you should um, consider in your designs. So when we go and make this room inspections in hospital wards or in patient rooms, we look on the left hand side, for instance, there is also a mock up of a floor um, of a ward of a Swiss hospital. You can see again, the, the floor design is done like in this check uh, um, pattern, which looks nice uh, because it reminds one of an old kitchen in older days. But from a functional aspect, especially for people who are suffering from dementia, uh, like the example I said before, it is not um, functional because the the dark con the the strong contrast between light and dark colored um, floor. Um, is uh, squares is is causing or is causing some falls, and uh, the pit. also if you don't have enough contrasts, elderly people or people with suffering from visual impairment won't recognize uh, a light 
uh, button to, to switch on or off the light. The same is for um, the bathroom. If somebody uh, needs to go to the bathroom and cannot see uh, or differentiate the, the, um, the color from the toilet, from the color of the floor or, or from the wall. So you need to, um, you need to consider contrast and, and this and, and the design of a color concept. And of course, if you, um, we also see that sometimes you have the patient board and that people who lie in their beds, in the patient bed, they are not able to read it because just uh, because very easily the, the type, the size of the type is too small. So um, when we are talking about age appropriate design, we can see that if the design of the environment is not uh, meeting the needs of all elderly people, there is um, this causes stress and this can complicate the adaption process of these uh, patient groups. So, and this can also lead to a restriction of independence or social participation if you think about the design of nursing homes. And um, so the aim of designers, architects, should be to optimize infrastructural conditions and um, to support the adaption of the spatial, to the spatial environment and by that promoting orientation and security through design. Um, visual impairment is something, for, of course, also very, very important in the case of signage or wayfinding in hospitals. You can see here a very recent example that we are working now with a Swiss University Hospital, uh, which contacted us uh, about um, a half a year ago. And it's a new building, very newly built, very beautiful, but it doesn't work because people who um, are been taken care of and also stuff, they have difficulties in finding their way through the hospital and also to orient themselves. As you can see on the left hand side, there is a, um, uh, an example of the signature. You can see the um, different, um, uh, different Stockwerke, Arne, you know, I'm sorry, I have the different floors, sorry, I sometimes I miss the English words. Um, the different floors of the hospital, which are um, in a white type. And the floor that you are, um, that you are in now, right now, that um, your own position is in a dark gray, which looks very nice. But if you look at the, the color of the wall, it's also a dark gray. So on the right hand side, we simulate uh, a visual impairment of a person who might not see very very well, who has also, who might also have like a yellowish filter over her eyes, like all, most elderly people have. So you won't be able to read anything just because of the contrast, the missing contrast of um, the type and the background color. Also here, if you think about the signage of uh, rooms, patient rooms or diagnostic rooms, it's also an, um, a question of the information hierarchy. So what is really important? Is it important to know that it's the room uh, OH13 or is it important that it's centrale diagnostic? So it's the, the, the room where diagnosis is happening. And if you see on the right hand side, somebody who suffers from visual impairment won't recognize or is not uh, able to read what is written on these signs. So these are aspects also that designers and architects should be aware of when designing for hospitals or healthcare institutions. Another thing is like an aspect of interior design. We can also look at situations or we see situations where the interior design doesn't promote communication. So if you think this is an example from a nursing home, um, these are two wards, ground floor plans of two wards which are next to each other. And one on the left hand side, you can see there are a lot of seating arrangements. You have sofas, you have chairs, you have the dining area, the TV area. And on the right hand side, you have the second ward where there is less um, seating arrangements and 
by the position of these seating arrangements, you can also see that some of these arrangements are communication promoting uh, seating arrangements, like on the left hand side, because people are sitting across the corner so they can see each other, they sit together and they don't sit next to each other like it is in uh, a lot of hospitals that people, especially in waiting areas, they just sit next to each other and don't have or don't make any eye contact. So I was talking a lot about projects in the area of three-dimensional design, so interior design or architectural design. But what we also do is um, design in um, two-dimensional design, like graphic design or visual communication design. And I would like to um, show you a project that we did a couple of years ago. It's done by... Um, visual communication designers of our um, of our working group in cooperation with the Inselspital in Bern. It was um, the development of picture sheets as visual aids for medical consultations. So this is a picture sheet that was developed by, by our team and the aim of this uh, visual sh uh, this sheet is that it supports the medical consultation of pediatric patients with their parents and the doctor. So as you can see you have different areas in this um, picture sheet. One in the upper half is um, an illustration showing the brain of, from the left and the right hand side and from above. And then you have a, an area where the doctor can put in some notes, some information about um, the treatment, the further treatment about the medication and so on. And um, as you can see here, so the upper part is a diagnosis specific section where um, the, the doctor can explain specific aspects of the diagnosis in this illustration. So, so the pa parents have a visual um, understanding of, of the illness or, or what, what is going to be treated. And the general section, the blue section, has some information about the therapy, the medication, the follow-up, um, also some key messages that the, the doctor can write down. And in this case, we decided um, consciously to make it like an analog solution because um, the team wanted the patients to be able to take this picture sheet back home, to have something physical, to take it home, to read it. And um, you can see here one example, which was filled out by a doctor. And um, by... Um, by looking how this picture sheet was accepted by patients and by doctors from the patient side, it was appreciated very well because they um, they they had something a, a visual explanation of of um, the diagnosis and of the treatment, and um, so they could take it home if they had questions. They could uh, call the 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 hospital again and ask. And from the uh, uh, doctor's side, it was quite interesting because they said as a feedback, it forced them to take more time for uh, the patient, to take more time explaining the things, to take the time to writing the things down. And so that uh, it supported this sheet, the, the communication between patient and doctors. Another project also, which was in, uh, in the, or is now going to finish in this year, was a series of projects. This project started in 2015 called dot dot comma dash. It's actually in German, punkt punkt comma strich from, for those of you who know German, it's like a saying uh, how to write, uh, to draw a children's face. And it was um, funded by the Swiss National Foundation and, um, Swiss National Science Foundation and also at different other foundations. And this was a project uh, with the aim to develop a tool for um, blind or visually impaired children um, to teach them uh, Braille. The, the, um, and um, this, uh, this tool was especially for children who are not yet in school. So it's for preschool children um, who will start learning Braille. And as you can imagine that children who can see, they are surrounded by typeface all the days or all the time. And uh, parents explain them the big M of micro means M because of micro. But if a child cannot see, so it doesn't have all these clues in its physical environment and cannot have 
have contact with type typeface. So um, there is a need to, to slowly introduce children suffering from blindness or visual impairment to Braille. And um, in this project, our visual communication design team worked together with experts in the field of pedagog uh, pedagogy of um, visually impaired children. It was uh, project partners from the University of Heidelberg. And they developed a, a, a series of booklets and it's called Alex und die Reise zu den Musterinseln. It's like Alex is uh, the protagonist of this book series. It's a little dot in the size of a braille uh, dot and his um, adventurous uh, trip to the Pattern Island. So as you can see, you have everywhere in these booklets um, I will go back, sorry, you have the black typeface, like we can read it for uh, parents or siblings who can see. So it's also an inclusive tool to include the whole family, seeing children and visually impaired children and uh, to have a learning tool for all of them. And you can see Braille Schrift um, in the lower section of uh, the type so that you can compare the uh, black uh, typeface with the braille typeface. Also this, when we talk about evidence-based design in, in the area of design, it is very, very important. In this case, it was important to test those um, examples to test the first prints, to test the parents, and we worked there with uh, visually impaired and blind children from Heidelberg, where they were testing the first prints of these patterns and telling us if they could um, sense it through their fingertips or if the pattern is too small or too dense, so the designers would have to change it. You can see here um, a detail of the pattern, and this is um, some impressions of the book. So it starts with simple patterns. Uh, it's a very colorful, cheer cheerful book. So also children who can see siblings, will, they, they are uh, looking forward to the next story, to the next booklet. What happens with Alex? What is he going to uh, experience on his journey to the pattern islands? And each side the children have to search this little braille dot Alex. There is everywhere there's a little braille dot uh, which is hiding and you can imagine that mostly the children who are visually impaired will find Alex uh, easier than their seeing um, siblings because they are getting more and more uh, sensitive towards uh, the, the um, they're, they're um, touching and feeling, the sensing the, the, um, the patterns. And this is a second example um, of the second book. And uh, we are now in a phase where these books will be printed and will uh, be, um, uh, which should be purchased, uh, I think, in the next year. And um, because of Corona, which is quite sad, also our work is, um, uh, limited because the printing company who was supposed to print this uh, uh, had to shut down. So we are always, uh, the team is now looking for new printing companies um, to be able to print these seven booklets. So this was uh, it from my part. Thank you very much. And I will go back to Anne because now we will uh, start with the Q&A questions. I've seen that you have already some questions. Thank you very much, Minu. Thank you, Arne, for the fantastic inputs you gave. And yes, you're right, there are definitely questions. Um, in fact, we also have um, Camilla, who will, um, with me together, we will organize Camilla Speranza here from UZI in, in um, Lugano, and we will lead the discussion with you together. Um, Camilla, I think you could go back to a question that has already been answered, but uh, through the chat, uh, but privately, and I think it's of relevance for everybody. Please, Camilla, you want to start with um, Rebecca's question? Yes, thank you, Nina. I saw that some questions has been already answered to Arnin in the Q&A box. Thank you for that. I think that it could be of interest for anyone if I read them again, and you could maybe answer to, to all, if you are agree with it. So Rebecca is asking, do you ever address other infection issues like doctors wearing ties 
It's not a design issue in terms of bricks and walls and airflow, but could be considered part of overall hospital design. Uh, okay. Maybe this was a misunderstanding. I already answered this, but I can read the answer um, if it's okay. So I've, we think that the clothing of the employees uh, play a vital role in the uh, healthcare communication design field. It might be the color of Kazakhs, uh, the hygiene problems that comes with doctor's ties as well as with their white coats. Um, when you see doctors uh, just rushing from the cafeteria to the uh, ward again. Um, as well as questions that might be risen if you look at security personnel um, that very often look like police officers instead of service employees. And um, moreover, the, the clothing of people, the employee clothing also influences performances of services and the quality of um, the conversations that you have with the patient. Like for example, the freedom of movement that some of the clothes al allow. Um, leads to um, the facilitation of, of processes at the bedside, for example, or um, if you wear everyday clothing during a conversation, a consultation, it might reduce anxiety in patients, etc. Thank you. Arne. Minu, did you want to follow up any additional no, points? Think... So maybe let me go to Adrian Wall. He had the microphone. Um, Adrian had a question about um, actually what the Swiss Center for Design and Health is doing in terms of collaboration, because you also mentioned collaboration. Are you collaborating with the ETH activities in architecture and care of the ETH rehabilitation initiative? Um, the research of the effects of wood and wooden buildings, uh, work that the architecture and care team is actually doing in Zurich. Uh, so what are the collaborations uh, within Switzerland on that? Sorry, do you hear me? Okay. Um, we, are, we are familiar with the uh, ETH activities in these areas and appreciate the research that takes place there. And similar individual projects and initiatives um, can be also found at the Haas LU in Luzern, also in Lausanne, other places in Switzerland. The idea of the Swiss Center for Design and Health is that we provide those activities with a place for mutual networking. And we are already in contact with some of the research groups. We have. Uh, we have not that many contacts within the ETH uh, ET right now. Um, our plan was to establish more and deeper contacts to uh, one research group in the US and the ETH research group as well this summer. And uh, well, due to the coronavirus uh, overall situation, we didn't manage to make that contact. Um, but if the SCDH will be or would be founded, um, the beginning of next year with our operational start, we consider this as a place where those initiatives can meet, where those initiatives can have this, um, this mutual exchange of ideas and this mutual exchange of research agendas. Right now, Switzerland has no such place. Um, and also, although the uh, ETH has different um, initiatives in those area, they are not really in a strong collaborative exchange, mutual exchange. So I think it could be, um, there, there could be a great opportunity to induce a place that is open to all those different initiatives popping up in Switzerland to meet at one place. Yeah. Thank you. Minu, did you have anything in addition about that? No. If not, I see Camilla, you have an interesting question from a low income perspective, low income country perspective, please Camilla. Yes, we have a question that says, do you have plans to adopt these insights or carry research in scarce resources setting, for example, African countries? The thing is that healthcare communication design is particularly well suited to support healthcare systems with limited financial resources. Since the introduction of design solutions or architectural solutions from the very beginning is often less expensive than um, finding solutions, very often technical solutions or uh, medical solutions, when the problem already has evolved from a certain point. So um, we know a lot of examples like the handing out of checklists, um, a lot of um, design related research that was done in the area of hand hygiene, where design solutions can provide a very, very big impact, especially to healthcare systems with um, with lower possibilities, financial possibilities. We in our group ourselves um, had no 
um, ongoing bigger corporations outside Europe. We are co uh, well, we are cooperating with uh, institutes in the USFA right now on a scientific level, exchange of researches, etc. Um, but we plan to do so in 2021. But um, Arne, I, I see Mike Nzeni has an additional follow-up question. I mean, mm -hmm. of course, uh, all what you did, what you presented and what Minu presents, it comes with costs and talking from a low and moderate income country perspective, particularly, I mean, costs are even far more relevant than what we think about costs in, uh, in, in the Swiss context. So, mm -hmm. um, so the design is very much influenced by, by financial decisions. So what is, what is your experience on that and how could one influence the planning early on to really reduce the costs, the total costs, because those who plan are different costs than those who later on suffer in the hospitals. Well, from my point of view, the healthcare communication design related solutions are very often pretty cheap. What, what, what you need is, is man or woman power to, to undertake those uh, analysis and to come up with the solutions. But you will have to paint a wall in a hospital, nevertheless, uh, despite the fact that you have the right or the wrong one. So um, what, what we try to provide is that we come out with solutions and with handbooks that allow people without having to, in, to, to hire researchers to find their own low-tech solutions. So for example, we published a book that allows logopedics to come up with their own picture sets without having to engage a designer uh, at any point. Um, and I think the second question is a very tricky and political one since we know that um, the context in which healthcare systems are um, prioritizing their financial um, possibilities are very different country to country, system to system. And we know that, for example, in Great Britain, there was a wave in the 1990s where the authorities have had this idea that um, helping the healthcare design sector would help to reduce overall costs. And it got lost in the 2000s and it was reinvented in the 2010s. So it is, it is very, um, wie sagt man, es ist recht abhängig von der politischen Agenda, die jeweils diese Lösung ermöglicht. It's very, uh, it's, it's relying on the political agenda that is um, empowering those kind of thinking. Mm -hmm. Good, I hope Gertrude, you are also happy. I mean, you referred also to the issue of low and middle income country resources, mm -hmm. resource allocation. I think this is a tough one to convince mm -hmm. actually. Mm -hmm. And I like your example of the UK army actually. So this is a off and on decision even in a wealthy country because it's perceived as being an additional cost. I mean, Maybe, no, did you want to add to that? Yes. I would like to add to that because um, I think also from our experience, it is really, really important to include these evidence-based um, design principles from the beginning, when from the minute you start building a hospital or reorganizing a hospital. Because the, uh, what we experience in the last years is that most of the time the hospitals come like one and a half year after the architect already started the planning. And then it's really a difficulty because there's already the design and so on. And we, Actually, most, mostly what we um, experience is not so much um, a problem that uh, from the side of the hospitals, but from the side of the architects that, uh, it's, that they don't see the need of, of redesigning their designs. And so I think it's not so much a problem of the costs, but more of, uh, I don't know, the, 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 the um, yeah, the, the, it's also, Actually, it's in the education of designers and uh, architects that they're, they're not trained to look at these aspects. Not yet, but we are trying to change that. I think that's very much true. And there is a follow up question. Camila, you asked, in fact, the question about education. Yes, we have a question here from Merita that she's asking. I was wondering, do you offer a master or specializa specialization program for healthcare communication design as an interdisciplinary program? Yes, we will start next year. Um, we, we, will we will have a module, wie sagt man, modular Aufbau, um, a, a further education program with different shorter um, packages. We hope to start next year, um, autumn next year, offline, we hope. 
and um, and we we try to build a, um, a masses um, a, a minor program here at the Bern University of the Arts in the area of uh, healthcare design, and we also are going to provide a further education program that is interdisciplinary and also are, um, addressing architects and nursing staff and and um, hospital management as well. And um, if I can um, continue here, because sure. I think this is really important when we talk about design, it's not only about design that experts do because nurses and doctors, they do a lot of designing all of the day. If you think about nurses changing the decoration and so on, it doesn't always have to need, uh, look like very neat and, and aesthetically, but it has to work. So it also is a lot about um, adaption of nurses to their working place that they feel well at their working spaces and that they have enough light and that their patients feel well. It doesn't necessarily have to be all like costly interventions that we are talking about, but it, it's more about interventions that work, that have an effect that affects uh, the working conditions and the uh, well-being of patients and staff and, and um, um, yeah. Very good. Minu, maybe you want to look at the question of Lucia Aguirre directly. I give you, a, give you a little bit time to think about that you summarize this longer question and, and provide an answer. While I would like to ask um, directly myself um, uh, one question. Yeah, I, I read this uh, question okay. before because I think it's a very, very important question about human error. And um, I've seen that uh, David Schwabbach is also one of your uh, participants uh, from the uh, Patient Safety Foundation of Switzerland. And um, we are working together with uh, David Schwabbach and the Patientensicherheit Schweiz's Patient Safety Foundation Switzerland, uh, which and and looking at these biases and about the environmental factors that cause errors with nurses. For instance, if you think about medication, the um, process of medication where nurses prepare medications for patients most or oftenly happen within a surrounding an environment which is very loud very noisy they get distracted by other nurses asking them questions so there have been studies where you have like very small interventions for instance if we're talking about costs for instance the nurse which is preparing the medication wears a west a west which is where it's written round uh, on the west is written don't disturb or a hand which is like a stop sign so everybody who's entering the room knows you cannot um, interrupt the nurse because she's preparing medication and if you prepare if you interrupt her you will cause you might cause errors and which have <laughs> fatal effects so we are looking at these processes which um, we also call them like design uh, aspects of how to prepare these medications, how to minimize mineral errors, human errors. If you think about now Corona, uh, a doctor entering a patient room without uh, doing the hand hygiene before Corona, this um, might have happened uh, um, from time to time. And there were also interventions like sheets where you could see hands on it, where printed hands were on it, like a reminder that you have to um, wash your hands or uh, to take the sanitation. And so we, I think a lot of errors could be minimized by small, very small interventions who would, um, who would support the working processes or re give short reminders of, of important aspects of daily life in the healthcare settings. Uh, maybe can you follow up a little bit on um, the issue of COVID? Because Lucia Aguirre, she also mentioned, referred to the tiredness, uh, which is, of course, a problem triggering errors. And now at times of COVID, uh, I mean, we know the healthcare professionals are extremely under stress and tiredness is a key issue. Is there anything new coming up in, in the discussions of you scientists in how to even even change maybe design issues that are more uh, more in compliance with the needs we currently have i think it's uh, i think corona only shows more what was um, there before, like um, aspects of light, aspects of air, like the the conditioning, the the air conditioning in the hospitals, also the lighting situation, which can cause fatigue. We know that depending on um, 
diffusing light or light that can change uh, the light quality during the day um, that can um, imitate like uh, the, the sun going up, going down. You know these uh, systems from Philips did studies in the Charité in Berlin with it. So um, there are possibilities by environmental possibilities by design like air, access to nature, also I, I told you before, like also areas in the hospitals where the nurses can have some privacy, go back or take a nap or, or um, to, to, to support the design with it. But other aspects, which is not so much about design, about envi environmental aspects, are more the processes, the structure, the daily working structure. And there we go into an area which is more about the overall working conditions of nurses and doctors and, and the staff in hospitals, which is not so much about design aspects but but they interfere I think. So in fact Sir Sergei Romashka I would like to know whether you're going to publish some guidelines on the topic so that hospitals could adopt certain practices. There are existing guidelines um, in, in as well as in English as in German as, a, as far as I know um, addressing very specific problems like um, mental health care and architecture for example or the homes for uh, people suffering from dementia and um, we're working right now on a guideline that is addressing light and color um, it takes some time we're not ready we're not we're not here yet um, but we're working on it and we had we we um, handed several guidelines to hospitals that we're cooperating with so there is some things that we already have and uh, we would be happy to share our knowledge um, with you. So if you have any specific questions um, from your working uh, environment whatsoever, don't hesitate to make contact with us because some questions we haven't mentioned today were already addressed in some of our research, others not. And uh, in some cases we can write, redirect you to some people who do research on specific topics we're not researching right now. So please don't hesitate to make direct contact if you have questions concerning specific aspects of that. Good, we are three minutes over, but let me finish with one question to both of you. Given we are in the time of digitalization now further triggered by COVID, and we are also in the time of personalizing healthcare. So is there any trend toward uh, you toward letting patients choose what how the room would look like through some digital choices. I mean, mm -hmm. you mentioned that some people hate this red, other loves it. Some people like nature, and others might prefer the brick. So, is there any trend toward letting people choose in what environment they get the care? Two answers. I think. Um, Patients are more and more involved in those processes, which is a good thing, but that has nothing to do with digitalization. And the other thing is that we have a big trend towards um, substituting one-on-one communication with digital communication. And we are hoping to stop that trend as well, or to contribute to stop this trend as well. As we know that digital medicine and a lot of telemedicine solutions that are on the market right today are people are making people sick. And we we strongly believe in the one-on-one -on -one communication and in the offline situation of healthcare. Uh, we strongly believe that uh, the current situation that leads to a lot of talent consulting um, will teach us a lot of the limits of this digitalization. Well, I have more in mind architectural digitalization. If I enter the room, my wall has a brick wall. And if the next patient enters the room, uh -huh, that one. nature. Yeah. So I don't know, Mino, a last statement from your side. Um, we, I mean, there are studies, for instance, um, in the field of psychiatry, people who can um, choose the colors of a lighting or a choose color of, of the surrounding, there are colors, or I think it also depends on the on the time people are being hospitalized. If we talk about nursing homes where people stay a long period of time, so the, the um, involvement or participation of patients is probably um, easier or, or um, because of the time and in a hospital where I only stay one or two days. So it would be more smaller intervention. But I think there will be also with the screen or digital uh, screens where you can choose um, pictures, uh, personal pictures that you want to have hang in your, in your room. And we also know here from Bern from a, a nursing home 
um, specialized in the care of dementia, people suffering from dementia, they have a lot of digital tools like um, a fake um, a fake aquarium where uh, fishes roll around. So there are uh, interventions starting, but they have to get uh, evaluated to see how people react on it. And there is not a lot there yet. So we have a lot of work to do, but we're looking forward to it. <laughs> Good. This sounds like uh, the right moment to finish and tell you that my wall is just at the beach uh, somewhere in a wonderful place. Uh, maybe it could be Lugano. There are at least palms down here. So the train has arrived in Lugano a little bit later than planned. I'm sorry for that, but it was a fantastic session. Thank you so much for uh, sharing your knowledge Thank you with for us, having us. And it was a great Thank pleasure you. to have you all at the Lugano Summer School. Thank you. Thank Enjoy you very much. Day. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.